Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for this body that is your body. Jesus, I thank you for the church, for your bride, for the people of God that you have redeemed by your blood. And I thank you that it extends way beyond the four walls of this building, that around your beautiful creation, you have myriads and myriads of people whose hearts you've changed, who love you deeply, who are living in your kingdom, who long to see your glory, and who delight to worship you. And I thank you that we belong to that body. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you would enlighten us, that you would allow us to understand these things, like that scripture we read just told us. These are spiritual things and can only be discerned spiritually. And so, God, I ask that your spirit would lead us to understand that we might know, that we might love you more deeply, that we might walk with you more faithfully. God, we pray that you would do this work by your power, by your might this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, now turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 4 for me. 1 John chapter 4. One of the things that I hope to do this morning uh, as I'm teaching is give you sort of an explanation for our philosophy of ministry here at Maricopa Springs. I think these two verses that we're going to look at in 1 John kind of set the table for me to explain to some degree why we do what we do as a church. And I think that's important. I started in pastoral ministry working at one of the largest churches in America. Uh, In fact, this church is very influential in what churches do. So much so that a lot of churches across America, even here in the Valley in Phoenix, are modeled after this church. We used to bring people in from all over the world, but particularly all over America, and do conferences on how to do church in the most effective way. And that experience was a good experience for me. I mean, I'm I'm talking a church of like 40,000 people. Uh, I think they now have like eight or nine campuses. And it was a really good experience for me. But one of the things that I learned over six years of working there is that I actually disagreed with the model of church that they were sort of packaging and shipping out to other churches. I disagree with the way that a lot of churches are modeled after that church. I think the way that the church kind of does things standard now is wrong. And so I want to give an explanation for that this morning. I think the church in a lot of ways has kind of wandered from what Scripture says in the way that the church kind of operates and what its primary purpose is on a Sunday morning in particular. Now, don't misunderstand. I appreciate any church that is proclaiming the gospel. I believe that Jesus uses all kinds of different churches, good churches, bad churches, dysfunctional churches, healthy churches, to accomplish his mission of building the kingdom of God and redeeming people out of sin. I'm grateful for every church that's pointing people to Jesus, whether they mean to do that or it happens by accident. I appreciate every church that's making disciples and that's seeking to reach lost people. And I don't see our church as being engaged in some kind of competition with other churches. That's not my point. But if you compare Maricopa Springs with sort of the standard model of how church is done these days, you're going to find that we're a bit different. Um, I use the word somewhat regularly that we're kind of unimpressive. Uh, We don't operate like a lot of people who are used to non-denominational churches might be expecting. Some of that's just because we're small and we're limited in our resources. I mean, We meet in a gymnasium with creaky walls. But a lot of it is also very intentional. We do it purposefully. We do it because we have a system of belief that undergirds what we do. And I think our two verses from 1 John speak to this to some degree. And so again, by God's grace, I hope to succeed in sort of explaining and expressing some of this to you, to sort of 
giving you uh, an understanding of why we do what we do. So look with me at 1 John chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. In 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 5, it says, They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, before I give you kind of a basic three-point outline for my sermon, which I've kind of been doing recently, uh, I want to remind you of what we talked about last week because we're like jumping in in the middle of a, a, a paragraph here. The first word of our text this morning is in verse 5, at least if you're using my translation, the ESV, it's the word they. They. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. I mean, in order to understand what's going on here, we have to know who the they are, okay? And this goes back to verses 1 through 4. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, then this should be somewhat of a review. And if not, I encourage you to check out our YouTube live stream or our, our YouTube channel where you can see the sermons. Or we've got uh, an audio podcast that you can access through our website. I think those will help you have some background to what I'm going to say. But to just sum it up briefly, they, in verse 5 are the people who are committed to the spirit of Antichrist, which is referenced in the prior verses. They are people who are enemies of God. They're alienated from the promises of Christ Jesus. These are people who are ignorant of God's salvation. They're opposed to the way of Christ, his morals, his ethics, his way of living, his call into a different life in the kingdom of God. These people are deniers of the Christian faith. They are committed uh, to evil. They are allied with evil. They are directed by the desires of the flesh. They, They do whatever passion tells them they should do in any given moment. They're non-Christians. They're not born again. They're unregenerate. Are you getting the, the picture here? They are anyone and everyone who is not filled with the Spirit of God. They are not those who are children of the Most High God. They are not sinners who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And look, as far as Christianity is concerned, I hope you understand, there are only two groups of people. John explains that to us right here. There are those who belong to God, and there are those who are the enemies of God. I mean, I kind of hate to put it in these terms, but it's us and it's them. It's we or they. They are from the world and we are from God. And so we have to speak in terms of these two groups of people this morning. Now, before we do that, let's just humble ourselves, okay? Because when you start to say like us and them, it can sound aggressive, it can sound prideful, it can sound arrogant and haughty. And so let's just humble ourselves and make sure that we don't let pride creep in and infect our hearts as we look at this idea this morning. We are not supposed to be filled with a sense of self-righteousness or arrogance like we're better than they. We belong to God because God has graciously saved us. He's poured out his favor upon us He didn't choose us because we're better looking or special or more intelligent or because we have more money or because we belong to some race or culture. We're not better than others. We are not God's beloved because of something inherently good in us. We are God's children by God's grace that he has poured out on us with tender mercy and great kindness. We're special to God because he's chosen to adopt us. But apart from his grace, we're just like them. We're no different. 
And so while John would want us to understand that there are two groups of people, sort of an us and them, God's beloved children and the enemies of God who are opposed to God, John would never want us to get a big head about this, to become conceited, to think that this is something that is our doing and not God's kindness to us. We've received a gift from God, and that's the only thing that sets us apart in reality. And there's no room for pride here because it's God's kindness that has done this. Now, to this outline for these verses. First, we should not expect that the world will understand our message. Second, we should not expect the church to dumb down the message. And third, we should expect that God will change hearts. Let me say it again. We should not expect that the world will understand our message. We should not expect that the church would dumb down that message. And we should expect that God will still change hearts. So let's look at each of these. To begin with, we should not expect that the world will understand our message. Friends, Scripture is abundantly clear that the message of Christ crucified is folly to the world. The world does not grasp it. The world does not understand it. The world does not appreciate it. I mean, people think that we are crazy because we're Christians. They think we've given up all kinds of personal freedom. They think that we're foolish. They think that we are idiots to believe in a God we cannot see. They think we're science deniers because we believe in a creator. They think that we're mean because we talk about sin. They think that we are history falsifiers because we believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. The world believes that we're self-righteous because we deny ourselves many things, right? We seek to overcome the passions of our flesh. We want to live a life of holiness. We claim that we actually know what truth is. And they think that that's arrogant. We live according to biblical morals, and they think that that's self-righteous. And so John tells us, like, everybody who is not from us can't possibly understand these things because they don't have the Spirit of God, and they're not, therefore, going to listen to us when we teach these things. They're blind. They're deaf. They're rebellious. They're hard-hearted. And many of the most basic Christian concepts are despised by the world. Do you understand that? I mean, simple things like saying that abortion is evil. You are a bigot if you say that. Gender is determined by God Almighty. You're some kind of phobia if you assert that. We claim that sex belongs only within the sacred union of marriage. And we are therefore self-righteous because we claim that. We boldly declare that people are sinners. And that's a persistent problem in their lives. We say that immorality is evil when the world doesn't even think that evil is an actual thing. We say that the truth is knowable and certain and you're accountable to it. And they think that that's crazy. We claim that Jesus is Lord, and the world says, I'm my own God, I do what I want. And we also would go so far as to say that God is actually furious with mankind because of the mess that we have made of relationships with one another, our indwelling hatred for each other, our self-centeredness, our pride. We as Christians claim that God is angry about that. And the only hope that a person has is to come before God and acknowledge these things and repent before him. That's the only hope. And that's what we claim. And many people, when they hear these things, they're going to be angry, they're going to be offended, they're going to say their feelings are hurt. The newest thing is they're going to claim that you're committing violence against them with your words. They're not going to continue to attend a church where a pastor gets up in front of them 
and very intentionally and lovingly insults them and diminishes their ego so that they will fall before God and give him glory. And we don't say these things to condemn people. We don't say thing, these things to hurt people's feelings, to wound them or make them feel bad. We declare them simply because they are true. And actually, God himself condemns people. Therefore, we don't need to be involved in that business. It's not our business to condemn people. But the ignorant world does need to hear these truths spoken clearly so that they can sort through them, so that they can potentially understand them, so, so that they can uh, face them. And the children of God need to consistently be told these things because out there, the world is full of lies and we need to be reminded of what's true. So that like John has been saying, if you've been with us through First John again and again and again, that we might be well equipped to discern what is true from what is false, what is good from what is evil, what is right from what is wrong, what is godly from what is ungodly. So the world does need to hear from us a message of hope and life and salvation through Christ Jesus because that's the good news of the gospel. We need to be proclaiming that. But that message can only be clearly communicated once it's firmly established that you and I by nature are dead in our sins. That we are not by nature right before God. By nature we are under the wrath of God. We are separated from God apart from the blood of Christ. But most people, they don't even agree with our very simple claim that people need a savior. They don't like even that concept. Most people think they're good. They think they know what they're doing. They think they have things under control. They think that they're the master of their own destiny. That truth is theirs to determine. And so when we tell people that they are by nature in the hands of an angry God and their only hope is repentance, we should not be surprised that they dislike that message, that they don't want to hear it, that they don't want to be a part of it, that they scorn us for proclaiming it. They are from the world, John says. Therefore, they listen to the world. Therefore, they speak worldly things. Therefore, they only want to hear what reinforces what they already believe, what tickles their ear and what feeds their ego. This brings us to my second point. Because the world will not understand our message, we should not expect the church to dumb down that message. Let me explain. See, I think a lot of churches, I shouldn't say it in those terms, I think there are churches that operate under the assumption, the wrong assumption, that if we just make the message a little bit more accommodating, then more people will come into our church to hear the message. And we can reach them that way. Actually, it's your job to go out to them and take the message. But this assumption that if we just make the message a little bit more accommodating, then people will come in. It's wrong, but it's actually very understandable if you are thinking in worldly terms. Right? I mean, if you have a message that's humbling, that's insulting, that's painful to acknowledge, then just soften the message. Remove the sting. Make it more palatable. And of course, more people will listen. Adapt the message, and then more people will listen to it. But that's not what John says here. Instead, John explains to us why the world rejects the message. And it's because the world cannot hear the truth. It only wants to hear positive, encouraging messages. It wants to receive those self-reinforcing messages that confirm what it already wrongly believes. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that the church should not change its message to accommodate the world. Because the only message the world is going to listen to is the message it wants to hear. 
So our concern when we gather together as a body, as a church, should not be that we might offend people. Our primary concern should be that we might offend God with something that we say. And that's what should drive us to seek to say what is true. And if you're preaching what the world will hear and accept, then I think you're not preaching what God has declared. Because the world is going to reject what God has declared. And so the goal of the church is to invite people out of the darkness that they are in and into the marvelous, wonderful, beautiful, loving light of Christ. It's an invitation out, not an invitation to make them feel comfortable where they are. The goal of the church is to be distinct, to be in a refuge from the error and self-destruction of the world. The mission of the church is not to be accepted by the world, but instead to boldly proclaim that all people are invited into the grace that Christ has offered, into the loving acceptance that God offers through him. And so our hope should never be in a more agreeable message or a more effective way of doing things. Our hope should always be in the power of God to soften stony hearts that are opposed to him, to make the blind see, to cause the deaf to hear, to raise the dead. And if we speak in terms that the world will understand, then actually we might get people to listen, but we lose all the power that might change them. If we speak the message of the gospel faithfully, however, we trust that the Spirit will interpret what is spiritual to people who could never understand without Him at work. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit there. That's my third point. I'm not there yet. Before I get there, I want to just use this opportunity for a moment to sort of explain our philosophy of ministry in light of these verses like I said that I would do. This, these verses, I think, explain, you know, to some degree why we do many of the things that we do. Verse 6 says, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Uh, like, for example, I think this verse helps you maybe understand why we don't pass an offering plate. Maybe you've been coming here for a while and you're like, every church I've ever been to passes an offering plate. Why doesn't this church pass an offering plate? And here's why. Because if God has changed your heart, then you become generous. We don't need to like guilt trip you into an offering plate passing. And I'm not suggesting that's why every church does this, okay? But we don't need to pass an offering plate in hopes that you have $10 cash in your pocket and you'll feel uncomfortable that we might be watching you. And so you'll take it out and put it in there to feel like a good person. A Christian with a changed heart wants to surrender everything to God, including their budget, their finances. And so... If you come to a church and they don't pass an offering plate, eventually you're going to be like, what, how do I give here? And we will help you figure that out. This will also maybe explain when John says, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. It preaches why we, or it explains why I preach the way that I do. You know, myriads of other pastors are better communicators than I am. I mean, we live in a world where, I'll just be honest with you, as a pastor, there's a lot of pressure to, like, be impressive when you preach because you can Google other preachers and they're great communicators and they're wonderful illustrators and they've got hipster coffee tables that they teach from and they cleverly adapt things from movies and music and memes and viral videos to get their sermon points across. And they do this I think a lot of times because they want to reach worldly people. And I, I, I'm not suggesting that, that, that that's not something that you could potentially do. But if you don't believe that the gospel itself is powerful enough to change people's lives, that it's beautiful enough to captivate people's eyes, that it's wonderful enough to grab the heart, if you don't believe that Jesus himself is worth everything and that he will get people's attention, then yeah, you have to be very impressive. Because if you don't believe Jesus is enough, then you've got to supplement Jesus with other things. 
And I'm not suggesting that I want to be boring or that I don't want to work to be better at what I do. I'm not excusing the fact that I could grow in this area. I'm only saying that the people who belong to God are going to hear the gospel in my preaching. Not because I'm great, but because it's about Jesus and it's from the scriptures. And they're going to hear that and appreciate it. Not because, like Paul says, I'm coming at them with powerful words in myself or tools of persuasion or amazing communication skills, but because through the preaching of God's word, the Spirit of God moves and works and does powerful things in people's lives. This is why when we gather together at Maricopa Springs, we pray together. Because the people of God love to pray. It's why we sing songs in worship together. Because the people of God love to worship. It's why we read long passages of Scripture together. Because really, who cares what I say? We care what God says. The people of God are eager to come before God in prayer. They're eager to surrender themselves. I mean, this is why our church, when somebody has a need, maybe paying their mortgage, we take some of the money that you give and we pay their mortgage for them. Because the people of God are eager to see their brothers and sisters well cared for. This is why we do what we call family churches that are supposed to be like families with all their beautiful well, all their beauty and all of their dysfunction all together. We gather in homes because we understand that we're supposed to be accountable to one another and we are accountable for one another. Like your life is not your own. In some way, not only does it belong to Jesus, it belongs to the other people in this room. And so we gather together outside of just this room. We share our lives. We don't live in isolation. We seek each other out in fellowship. This is why our church is honest about sin and the need for repentance. It's why we take communion and we remember what Christ did to redeem us. This is why we don't use laser lights when we sing worship songs. Why we don't chase the latest, most awesome music fad that you might hear on the radio. Because God's people don't care about the form. They care about the substance. Right? It doesn't matter whether it's drums or voices, whether it's guitars or pianos, whether it's violins or trumpets. The form is irrelevant. The substance is what matters. We are eager to worship in spirit and in truth, not in any particular style. And so I hope you're beginning to see and understand. Am I, am I saying that all out, every other way of doing it is wrong? No. I'm just explaining to you why we choose to do it the way we do. Because First John, John tells us, we are from God. And the people of God are drawn to these things. Whoever knows God listens to us. At Maricopa Springs, we're always eager to do things better. And I'm not even getting close to suggesting we're doing things perfectly. We want to improve and we want to change where that's necessary. It's not, this is not an excuse for things that we do poorly or or, uh, a refusal to try and improve on things that we could do better. We just don't feel the need to dress up the gospel of Jesus so that people will be attracted to it. Jesus is attractive. And the world is only going to listen to the world anyway. But the people of God are eager to listen to God. And this brings me to my final point. We should expect that God will change hearts. Do you expect that? We should expect that if a worldly person walks through that door and we proclaim Christ crucified, that some of those people will be gripped because God changes hearts. The power to change people is not found in buildings. It's not found in programs. It's not found in curriculum. It's not found in trendy things. It's not found in skillful communication or certain styles. It's not found in our competence or our efforts at all. 
It's found in God's power. We're not shrugging off all responsibility that we have. I think that we want to be as effective as possible wherever we can be effective. And that means, again, evaluation and maybe tweaking things and making sure that they're coming across right and clear. But we simply acknowledge that when God calls people to himself, he does so by his power and nothing can stop it. And if we call people to God, we do so in our own power, unless it's his spirit, and we have no power apart from him. And so when God builds his kingdom, he does so by his might. When God changes hearts, it's his spirit that brings people from the darkness of death into the light of his glory. I don't do that. You don't do that. God does that. It's his work. And we should expect him to be at work whether our model is polished or whether it's rugged. Because when God pierces hearts with the truth of the gospel, Jesus gets the glory, not us. But I can assure you that if we corrupt the message, if we dumb it down, if we make it more palatable, if we try to make it more attractive, if we make it about something other than Jesus, then we're not from God. If we do that and the world then listens to us, it's because we're speaking worldly things. I want to close by reading 1 Corinthians 2 again with you. And this time I'm just going to stop at a couple of points and just make some very summary statements. Flip back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and we'll start in verse 1. I want people to read along, so I'm going to wait for the pages to stop ruffling. I love that sound. And it's okay. We, we, will, we love to wait patiently for you. So this is the Apostle Paul, and he writes, And I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul came to non-Christians in the city of Corinth and in weakness he preached Christ crucified. He was not the kind of guy that you would see on Google with millions of views. And in a demonstration of God's power, despite Paul's weakness, God changed hearts. God gave fruit to Paul's message. Verse 6, Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this uh, age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Here, Paul explains that the world saw his message as foolishness because the world is full of fools. But to those who belong to Jesus, they understood the message of Paul as being divine in nature, the secret hidden wisdom of God. And when the Spirit indicated that to them, they turned to God in faith and repentance. And they turn not because of the impressive ministry of Paul, but because of the power of the Spirit and the beautiful nature of his message. Verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? 
So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Paul goes on to explain that we've come to understand and believe these things not in our own power or not because of Paul's flourishy way of doing it, but because of God's Spirit. We are from God. And therefore, we're eager to listen to the things of God and we're eager to reject the lies of the world. And we expect that God's Spirit will always bear fruit where the Spirit of God or where the gospel of God is proclaimed. Verse 14 Listen to this verse. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This wasn't in my notes, but I feel compelled to say this. If, if you've been sitting here and you're like, great, I have no idea what you're talking about. It might be that you're new to this and that's okay, or it might be that the Spirit has not revealed it to you. And so go to God and ask him to reveal it. Verse 15, the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. No wonder you understand the things of God. When God speaks, we're eager to hear him. We don't feel pressure to conform our message to the world because the natural person can only understand natural things. They can only grasp the fact that Christ is crucified if the Spirit reveals it. And so we preach it clearly and we preach it boldly, expecting the Spirit to transform hearts. And the Spirit doesn't need our help to make it more understandable. He's quite capable of making the blind see. Now, one last passage, one last section. He says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Ooh, and now we get the warning. At the end of everything that Paul has said about the Spirit revealing these things, we get a warning. Paul points to their lives and he says, look at the fruit. Consider what this means, that you behave this way. If the Spirit does these majestic powerful, beautiful, radical things in people's hearts to change them. How can the church still be worldly? How can we look like this? How can there be jealousy or strife or division or anger? His point is, there must not be. It, it shouldn't be like this. Because the Spirit has done a work in us. We are from God, and therefore we should look like Christ. We should be spiritual people because we know God and we listen to him. And if we look worldly, then let us examine our hearts to see where we stand before God, to see whether we truly are in the faith. So I want to close by doing just that this morning. We're going to take communion, hold off on opening the cup, because I'm going to take more of your time. I just want to make clear that communion is a time for those of us who placed our faith in Jesus. This represents his body and his blood. It's our spiritual nourishment. And so if you're not a Christian, then I would ask that you would not take communion with us. Unless, in this moment right now, you want to turn to Jesus in faith and repentance. You just tell Jesus, I'm sorry, help me believe, I love you, whatever. The Spirit will tell you what to say. And if you do that, then I invite you to take communion with us. 
But communion is an exclusive celebration for those of us who've been saved by the blood of Jesus. And I hope that's you. So what we're going to do for those of us who are Christians, we're going to walk through this time of confession. And we do this from time to time. I'm going to read some prompts. We do have this on the screen, right? We got this up there? Okay, cool. So you can see, I'm going to pray for us. And then I'm going to lead us through some prompts that you'll see kind of at the top of the screen. And then I want you to say out loud the bold part at the bottom of the screen. So join me in doing this. First, let's pray. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, and also by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We've been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We've not been true to the mind of Christ. We've grieved your Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For all our unfaithfulness and disobedience, for the pride, vanity, and hypocrisy of our lives, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For our self-pity and impatience and our envy of those we think more fortunate than ourselves, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For our unrighteous anger, bitterness, and resentment, for all lies, gossip, and slander against our neighbors. Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For our sexual impurity, our exploitation of other people, and our failure to give of ourselves in love, Lord, have mercy upon us for we have sinned against you. For our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our intemperate pursuits of worldly goods and comforts, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For our dishonesty in daily life and work, our ingratitude for your gifts, and our failure to heed your call, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, Lord, have mercy upon us. We have sinned against you. For our wastefulness and misuse of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For all false judgments, for prejudice and contempt of others, and for all uncharitable thoughts and actions toward our neighbors, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For our negligence in prayer and worship, for our presumption and abuse of your means of grace, Lord, have mercy upon us, 
for we have sinned against you. For seeking the praise of others rather than the approval of God, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. For our failure to commend the faith that is in us, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against you. Show favor to your people, O Lord, who turn to you in weeping and fasting and prayer. For you are a merciful God, full of compassion, long-suffering and abounding in steadfast love. You spare when we deserve punishment, and in your wrath you remember mercy. Spare your people, good Lord, spare us. In the midst of your mercies, look upon us and forgive us through the merits and mediation of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You can go ahead and open up this communion cup. And there's a top film layer that you open first and then the other part. At home, I hope that you have bread and juice available. The scriptures say, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Father, what a precious thing to have forgiveness of our sins. We thank you that when we cry out to you, Lord, have mercy on us, you hear that prayer and you answer it. We thank you that you take away sin and shame. You take away condemnation and fear. And we thank you that you not only take away the consequences of our sin, but you take away the power of sin in our lives. That we can grow and heal and get better and no longer walk in these things by the power of your spirit. We are not only redeemed, but we are remade. And we worship you for that. Jesus, for your body and your blood given for our salvation. We give you all glory and all praise. You are worthy. Amen.